by the horrible massacres in Bucha, Ostome, Irpin, Brodyanka, all of which appeared on TV screens around the world. By September of that year, international agencies had documented 30,000 war crimes. Russian troops bombed entire cities. Mariupol became a symbol of total destruction as hospitals, maternity wards, high-rise buildings, train stations, and schools were targeted. Over 100,000 people have been deported to Russia. 20,000 children taken against the wishes or even the knowledge of their parents. In occupied areas, areas of Ukrainian literature and language are banned. Anyone who claims Ukrainian identity is called a Nazi or a fascist. Russian TV describes the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, in dehumanizing terms as a fascist Jew, a clown, a cocaine addict, a murderer, and a Nazi. Not just Russian authorities and soldiers, however, are complicit in the war. So are many ordinary Russians. We know from intercepted phone calls that mothers and wives encourage soldiers to murder, rape, and steal. A recent film just premiered in Berlin, Intercepted, which tells, which uh, gives viewers these, these intercepted phone calls. A Levada Center poll conducted a year and a half after the invasion revealed that almost 70% of Russians support Putin and the war. Even worse, many Russians who do not support the war refuse to consider returning territory. It is not possible to deny anymore the crimes against humanity, the war crimes. Therefore, Putin's supporters and those who refuse to call for Russian troops to leave are complicit in the criminality. We need to be clear, this is not just Putin's war, this is Russia's war. Everybody needs to reject not just the violence, but the land grab. As a result, and you've heard this already, 8 million people were displaced, of whom 5 million had to escape abroad. 260,000 have come to Canada, 26,000 to Manitoba. The bombing of cities has continued for two years. Russia launches most of its attacks, its, its uh, rocket and drone attacks at night forcing people under, to underground shelters where they sleep, look after their children, even conduct schooling. Russian troops arrive with handcuffs to subdue those who resisted, with incinerators to dispose of murdered bodies. They killed tens of thousands, perpetrated rapes, mutilated people, and they have created torture chambers and concentration camps, dozens of them as on the site of Izolatia, a factory that was made into a, converted into an art center by Ukrainians, and is now a detention camp that with torture cells. Today, anyone on occupied territory who refuses to take Russian citizen, citizenship can be denied medical aid, or a pension, or can be given a prison sentence, or killed. So what have we learned? What is, what is, what is we been taught? We know that Russia's intervention was from the start genocide. Putin, Vladislav Surkov, Timofey Sergeyev, and numerous Russian TV commentators have explicitly and repeatedly stated that the war's purpose is to end Ukraine's existence as a state, a people, a culture, to extinguish its language and history, which they claim never existed. For them, Ukrainians are at best a sub ethnos of Russians. Anyone who believes otherwise, they say, must be re-educated, imprisoned, or killed. This is stated openly by neo-fascist thinkers like Alexander Dugin, by Sergeyev, who stated during the Bucha massacres Ukraine's desire for independence and a European way of life was a greater danger to Russia than G German Nazism. Of course, we don't believe this because we can see that the Russian-speaking population in cities of eastern Ukraine are the ones that are being leveled 
and those are the ones that are resisting. Today, Tatars, Jews, Catholics, Orthodox, Muslims, people of all backgrounds and faiths are being killed simply because they are citizens of Ukraine and refuse to be part of Russia. We have also seen how bravely Ukrainians have resisted. The world was stunned by the country's spontaneous effort to support the troops. Over half the population has volunteered in one way or another to deliver food and clothing to troops and citizens in distress, to take in people fleeing the violence, to sew camouflage nets, to create apps that track incoming missiles, to crowdfund humanitarian aid, military clothing, vehicles and drones. We've also learned that Ukraine can win because we watched as it pushed back the Russian army while farmers towed away hundreds of tanks. An estimated 360,000 Russian troops have been killed, including the entire Wagner army, which was recruited from conflicts in prisons. A third of the Russian Black Sea fleet has been destroyed. We know that with the help of Europe, North America, and other countries, Ukrainians can intercept rockets and save lives. Five more Patriot batteries can protect Ukrainian airspace from incoming missiles. We've also seen that life goes on. Schools, universities, cinemas, concert halls, museums, galleries continue their work. Twelve new bookstores have opened in Kiev alone. Numerous restaurants are being created, often by displaced Crimean Tatars and other people from occupied regions. Ukrainian literature is booming. Many writers have switched to using the language exclusively, including Volodymyr Rafeyenko, who has vowed not to write in Russian again. Using Ukrainian has become a way of protesting the aggression and supporting the struggle. We've also seen people around the world support refugees, universities have helped displace scholars, publishers produce books on Ukraine, translate Ukrainian works into Western languages, films, art exhibitions, concerts have displayed Ukraine's talents. All this helps to open eyes to the richness of Ukraine's cultural life and to demonstrate that Ukraine indeed is not Russia. So how do things stand now? Russia's economy is much bigger than Ukraine's. It is spending 100 billion, or 6% of its GDP on the war annually. Ukraine spends 40 billion, which constitutes 25% of its GDP. But thankfully, it receives military aid from the international community. And also, its morale is much higher than the Russian troops. The aid provided by Europe amounts to 0.15 of its GDP. US aid amounts to 0.20 of its GDP. The highest level of support relative to GDP is provided by Estonia and Lithuania at 1.5%. These figures show that helping Ukraine is not a burden on Western economies. It is estimated that if Western countries committed to spending even half of what Estonia and Lithuania spend, this would allow Ukraine to drive out the aggressor. After all, Russia is not a strong economy. Corrupt and mismanaged, it relies on parts and products from elsewhere. Western countries now realize that they underestimated Putin's intentions. No reset or partnership with Russia was possible because Putin's goal, goal all along was to use naked force to overturn international security arrangements. Many now understand this. Sweden and Finland have moved to join NATO. European nations have refused to be bullied by Putin or to back down. Today, all global actors have a stark choice, either to support Ukraine or to bow to Russian aggression. Finally, why should we help Ukraine? Excuses for not helping include Fear of escalation, fear of what might happen when the current regime is, which is trying to re-imperialize Russia, collapses. Kremlin propaganda plays on these concerns. We have seen, however, that inaction only makes things worse. As everyone knows, the schoolyard bully has to be confronted, otherwise it would be encouraged. Unless Putin's team has stopped, all international agreements will 
be pointless, because tyrants will conclude that military aggression is the only effective argument. The attack on Ukraine, as we have heard from other speakers, is therefore an attack on the international community. When Russia shoots down passenger planes and lies about it, when it blocks shipping routes and prevents the delivery of grain, when it supports dictators, when it threatens to nuke the UK and US or to invade the Baltic states, it is destroying hopes for peace and security around the globe. In the end, Russia must reform itself, but it will only do so if defeated in the present war. Its military defeats in the past have produced reforms. This happened after the Crimean War of 1853-56, after the Russo-Japanese War 1904-1905, and after the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1990. Yes, these reform periods were followed by a return to authoritarian rule, but such relapses are not inevitable. Germany and Japan, we recall, changed profoundly following their defeats in the Second World War. If Russia does not re retreat, the message will reverberate around the world that aggression pays, that agreements can be broken, borders changed, human rights ignored, mass terror used with impunity. This message must be resisted by all people who believe in protecting human lives, upholding international con conventions, and humane values. We teach these values in museums, such as the one we are in today. We learn them from the study of human civilization, from the earliest histories, and we are guided by them in contemporary anti-imperialist, anti-colonialist thinking. When Russia bombs museums and galleries, schools and theaters, it demonstrates contempt for these values. Shows that it wants to live outside all the norms that have been defined by the United Nations, international conventions and courts since the Second World War. Russia is today an autocracy sustained by a passive population. Ukraine, on the other hand, is a democracy with a vibrant civil society. Its people want to govern their own lives, and they are dying every day, every hour, to prove this. Their sacrifices are being made on behalf of all people, because they realize that a stable peace is impossible as long as Russia is committed to making its neighbors into vassals. Russia needs to be contained until it undergoes regime change and democratization. Otherwise, the problem alone, the problems will only multiply. We must urge our leaders, all responsible people, to support Ukraine in its struggle for survival. Because its cause is our cause. It is everyone's cause.